when we uh, were deciding um, as a committee, um, you know, the kind of um, what we wanted to, to present, I guess, to the community. And uh, one of the things that came up was the, uh, the idea that you know, we, we do have many talented uh, writers from our communities, um, that our people have other ways um, of telling stories and um, through your uh, use of your, of your body and your voice to, uh, to commu communicate a story that is um, just as compelling and, and, and um, evocative as a lot of the poetry and other stuff that we've been hearing over the last couple of days, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to mention um, another uh, area where another thing we wanted to do was um, to present uh, local writers from Calgary and surrounding area. Um, that's our invitation to Jolene, who I might add, this was her very first uh, public reading uh, of her work, and uh, we've never known. You've learned the whole idea of giving a little bit to make people want more, and I think uh, we, we wanted more tonight, so thank you very much. Um, I just want to mention other local writers that we've had uh, be a part of our gathering um, over the last couple of days. Um, we've uh, had Sable Sweetgrass um, and David Wells do uh, present their work um, uh, last night. Uh, David actually did um, a genre that's uh, becoming more and more popular amongst our youth, and that he did a performed a hip hop um, piece um, that was about residential schools and the trauma and healing that, that about that experience. Um, we also had Michelle Thrush read um, from a, a play that she's working on. Um, we had Sarah Scout um, share some of her work um, in essays, uh, in essays, but also in her her zines, um, and um, also um, we've had, we're very honored to um, have Beverly Hungry Wolf um, be a part of our gathering for the last two days, and Beverly um, has been, um, was one of the people that came up uh, in the very beginning of when we started talking about writers that we'd like to have, and um, um, Beverly being from the Kainai uh, First Nation, but also being, uh, I think, one of one of the uh, one of the aunties that, that are out there um, by sharing her uh, her stories by uh, listening to the voices in her community and following their guidance um, and also venturing into new initiatives uh, such as film um, she's definitely uh, someone that uh, gives young writers um, someone to look to uh, for guidance uh, when starting out on this so thank you for really um, not being from here, I'm always very aware of, of that, that this is uh, not my territory and I'm, I'm thankful um, to, uh, to have been welcomed here. Um, uh, as I said, I'm from Saskatchewan and I'm Cree from there. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that the Cree and Blackfoot have a long and turbulent history filled with lots of uh, war and, and also lots of love, and <laughs> I, have a half, I have a sister who's half and half to contest to that. <laughs> um, so, yes. <laughs> so, um, as, I, as I said, we, uh, we did definitely want to feature local writers uh, from this area um, who are either, um, uh, have been here since um, the time of, that we talked to the stars, uh, or who have made Calgary their home. And our third writer is in that category. Um, Sharon Prue Turner uh, is a Métis writer who holds a master's in English and has taught writing and literature at the University of Calgary. Her memoir, Where Rivers Join, was shortlisted for the Edna Stabler Award for Creative Nonfiction. Sharon's work has been widely anthologized in crisp blue edges, indigenous creative nonfiction, my home as I remember, writing the land and elsewhere. So please join with me in welcoming Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
This is my granddaughter, Jessenia. Horse fall. Amazing horse fall. I want to thank uh, the Blackfoot peoples for so graciously sharing this land with all of us and um, to have my little grandchildren grow up here and my children. I want to thank my daughter, Barb, for being here tonight and uh, my little granddaughters and also Janine. Stephanie, thank you for being here tonight. It's always wonderful to have young, our young future writers here. I know that you're a secret writer. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to let you know too that um, unbeknownst to many, this uh, I've, I've actually written and published four books. Uh, you mentioned Where the Rivers Join. That was my first book. It was a memoir. Uh, I have a second book called What the Aunties Say, which came out in 2002, and it's a, a long story slash poem about um, these old ladies. There's an old lady who's about 400 years old. It's the stories of the Métis women in my family. Also, uh, a recent book called She is Reading Her Blanket with Her Hands. It's a collection of poetry. And most recently, uh, I have this book that just came out. It is called She Walks for Days, Inside a Thousand Eyes, A Two-Spirit Story. And this is a book that took me 11 years in the making. It's a, a kind of a, a historical fiction, I guess you could say, and it involves um, a, a, a woman from our time, a Métis woman who meets up with about, um, um, maybe about 10 or 12 women Aboriginal women from the past who were written about by missionaries and, and priests and uh, explorers and those dudes who were known in their day uh, by these people as uh, two-spirited women, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual women. And um, there are also other characters in the book. I'm very happy with the book. Uh, if you're interested, there are copies of um, a lot of our, all of our books out there including this one. There's lots of them for sale out there. Um, but we've been asked to read only for 10 minutes because there are many of us reading it. So I'm not going to read from this book, even though I'd really like to, because I can't really do it justice in 10 minutes. So what I am going to do is I have some uh, more recent poems that I wrote um, at a, uh, a retreat. Maria Campbell was a facilitator at a retreat for Aboriginal women, and uh, our focus was mothering and grandmothering. And I'm, I'm going to read, I think, two poems from the, uh, that are, will be uh, published in Exile magazine. The person in here that I mentioned is Grandma Joan, who's actually my late mom, who passed away many, many years ago. And uh, so I kind of like to dedicate these poems to her because I know she's here tonight. This one is called Rhythm Methods and Watery Melodies. Sour apples or pie in a basket plucked from a tree far from the farmhouse, and under the tree a blanket cover in the wind, sweet solitude of an afternoon alone, and young Joni dancing, her dress swirling high, both knees beautiful still, and love in her eyes. Ten years later, young still, and ducks on the water, the blue on their backs shining out from their, her seven little children. Through Grandma Joan's dark eyes, their circles pooling laughter from the beach. There would be days like that. And there are many days like this. <laughs> There would be days like that, 
days when hearing laughter from around the kitchen table meant a game of euchre or crib and danger was as far away as the beach and the ducks and the heat. But children can neither measure time nor distance. How could I have known that for a teen, half an hour's walk was all it would take to reach the sand and trees that led to that welcoming beach and the warm August waters of the Ottawa. Her upgrading elementary through high school. Oh, I think I may have missed something. No, I didn't. How could I have known that throughout my teens I'd spend my years sitting at the kitchen table helping Grandma Joan with schoolwork so different from my own? Her upgrading elementary through high school and on to business college while I juggled her learning and my own. I even learned shorthand, which I promptly replaced with the sweet scent of love in my eyes. I'm multitasking. <laughs> and the sweet scent swelled with my firstborn, Graham. Walked to the hospital with my suitcase in hand, happy and excited. The hospital was French and Catholic, and the nuns tried to make me wear an old tin ring on the wedding finger. So I made like I couldn't understand French, but they knew I could, and they called me Madame this and Madame that, as if that would wed me in time. My labor was induced. My labor was induced. The baby's head was too big, the doctor said, and I walked the halls, clinging to handles and bright lights, facing the pain of my own. I was there when these two were born, too. <laughs> hmm? They were both born with their eyes wide open, these two girls. You like that, eh? She likes the mic. I don't know where it was. Nurses changed shifts three times that day before my baby was born and a nurse took him away while the sweet smell of life was fresh as the memory of my own birth, his body, my heart. I wanted to breastfeed. I told her and she made like she didn't understand English. Not Maisie's first time at a reading of mine. The last time she tried to escape as well. And then, oh, she told me to go to sleep, rest, in French. And then in English, brought a bottle of formula after baby was wiped down and dressed and wrapped. We had no visitors all the days we were there. I called my auntie when baby was born and went back to my bed to sleep. It took Grandma Joan a long time to warm up to Graham. It wasn't long adoring him once she warmed up, but it was the warming up that took a while. 
She was bound and determined I'd do it on my own. You chose this path, she said. Now live with it. Thing is, I loved my new path and lived with my baby, I did. A prouder mama couldn't exist, and what I really wanted was to share my joy. Yes, when he was born, he looked like a cross between Diefenbaker and Mr. Magoo. And yes, his head was very large. But me, I took bus rides in the city just to face him out from my belly so those old ladies could coo and caw at him. I'd sit on park benches and front steps and go down the street house by house, only later learning that's not really how things are done in the city. My boy was born while the thunder reached down from the snow clouds and onto this place that was unfamiliar to us, a city. We'd grown to know one another in a quieter place. But there we were nonetheless, and we didn't stay long in that city. I'd been at Carleton on a scholarship, culture shocked and taking math. Those were the days before computers and a single mom couldn't get a student loan in Ontario. Could in Alberta though. Right about the time I started helping Grandma Joan with her homework, when I was 12 or 13, I learned about Chinooks in school. I was both fascinated and didn't believe it for a minute. So up we packed, me and my baby boy, and moved to Calgary. Wasn't there two weeks when I found I couldn't get a student loan for two years. Didn't care, never looked back. And though I longed for my homeland, for water and bear and sand, there's a breathlessness about the prairie that opened up my life like a basket of sweet red apples under a late summer tree, the white of my hair against the bark of the green of the tree. Thank you very much. I just have to say thank you, Joy, for being here. Oh, Joy, my sister.